want to read a little uh, reading out of the book, Why Suffering by Ravi Zacharias. This is not new to all those who attend here. <clears throat> and I just bear with me, it's a little bit of a long story, but a dear friend who works in our ministry had a surprise pregnancy when she was around 40. The doctor gave her some tests and concluded that the risk that the baby that the baby was abnormal was too great and strongly recommended an abortion. She said she would not go that route and would have the baby. The doctor was so firm in his assist insistence that she abort the baby that she didn't feel comfortable any longer as, he, as his patient and found another doctor. The baby was born in due time, not only as healthy as any child, but in fact he is a, as far superior in intelligence to his peers and always at the top of his class. He is fluent in English and Spanish and has now asked to learn Mandarin. When he was younger, he looked at his mother one day, all dressed up for an evening out with her husband, and said to his father, Daddy, isn't Mommy looking so pretty tonight? Like a typical male in his middle years, his father took a quick glance at his wife and replied, Yes. Andreas reprimanded his father and, No, 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 Daddy. That's not how you say it. She's not just a friend. She's your wife. Look at her again and say, Patricia. You are beautiful. <laughs> Here's the amazing extension to that story. The children's clinic where Patricia takes Andreas for medical checkups and care is in the same building as the office of the doctor who wished to abort him. On one occasion, she tried to introduce Andreas to the doctor, but he refused to meet with them. The hubris of playing God ultimately makes it almost impossible to accept the evidence that shows you have to be so wrong. In this case, so wrong that he would have destroyed a life with great potential for, the splendor, for splendor and hope. Turning a blind eye to reality will not eliminate it, but will only heighten our indictment. So we swing from Scylla of freezing the dead and hope that we might res resuscitate them in some future time to the care of dis of killing the living in the hope that we will never have to see them. I know there's a lot in that story and a lot to think about. But what I want to focus on today is the role the doctor played of playing God and the fact that you and I often try to play God. And how many times in my young naivety that I thought, oh, yeah, I can't wait to give people solid advice. I can't wait to have that role in their life. <laughs> and um, one of the first times it happened and I saw him take my advice, it looked probably what that doctor felt like too and it looked like Ugh. don't take my advice I don't know what I'm doing but how often we take that role upon ourselves that we think that we know what's best for, for someone else and that we actually think that we have a right to speak that into their lives when they have their own relationship with God their creator can speak to them we are here to encourage and lift up and in James 4 11 and the message it says don't bad mouth each other friends it's God's word his message his royal rule that takes a beating in that kind of talk you're supposed to be honoring the message not writing graffiti all over it God is in charge of deciding human destiny who do you think you are to meddle in the destiny of others what I want to encourage you is to not take that place of codependency in someone else's life and take on the role of God but let them have their own relationship with God and be that encourager that encourages them, that lifts up the word of God, that doesn't tear it down, but we edify one another. And on the flip side of that, I want to say how many times I looked to people to be my God. You know, a few months ago, we well established that I do not like the process, and my father so eloquently reprimanded me in front of all of you. But um, I don't love the process. I want to know immediately what's going to happen. I want words that give me confidence and peace. And oftentimes, instead of waiting patiently for my Heavenly Father to speak what he wants to speak to me, I turn to other people and I say, I look for an answer. And I, man, sometimes I just hold on to it. Do they even love God? I don't know. Do they even know God? I don't know. Do they, have, have they heard of him? I don't know. I'm just so desperate for something to bring me peace. When God is saying, in the verse previous to that, it talks about, when you just turn your affections in a whisper to God, he is there. And may we turn our attention, our focus, and our affection to our Heavenly Father and let him be the ruler of our hearts and the guides of our destiny. 
If God in his infinite wisdom, not the God that we put in a small box, but if our God in his infinite wisdom is so okay with me having free will and, the entire, and giving free choice to everyone on this planet, if he is so okay with that, I can be okay with what other people are choosing to do and going through. And I stand beside him or behind him or in front of him and I cheer them on and beckon them to come deeper into a relationship with Jesus, a more real and honest relationship with God, that's my role, and that's my job. And may my attention not be turned to the people of this world, but to my Heavenly Father.